Uh, I'm Karen Hannes. I work with Intermountain Donor Services in Salt Lake. I uh, am an LCSW and provide follow-up support and um, liaison work between donor families and recipients. And we also have a couple of tribute programs yearly that we provide for the donor families. And I'm kind of the main person that, that works if recipients have questions about maybe writing to a donor family or even a question about thinking about writing, they could call me and I could help them with that along with their social worker, transplant social worker. Um, I'm going to introduce Jerry Osmond. She is a donor mom and she will spend the next little while talking about her experience and then I will follow up after she's done. All right, let me just get this on here. Yep. Does that work, or do you want it? Is that okay? Okay. Um, when Karen asked me to come and speak to this group, I was really excited. I've done it a couple of times before. And I didn't realize some of the things that you guys go through as far as while well, you're waiting. And, and I really kind of wanted to share my experience with you and my son, who was the one that donated to kind of put, I don't know, help you, you put your mind at ease about some things because the first time, which was, I don't know, about four years ago when I came out, out here, um, it really broke my heart um, with some of the feelings that, that the group shared with me because I didn't want you to, to feel that way. Um, my son was 16 when he passed away. We live here in Salt Lake and he was going through driver's ed class and IDS has a great public education program that goes around and helps educate driver's ed classes, health classes, giving people a better understanding of how organ and tissue donation works. And he had that class. And he came home and actually struck up a conversation with me that very day. And he asked me if I was an organ donor. And I kind of looked at him and I thought, why are you even bringing this up? And he said, well, we learned about it in school today. He told me some of the things that he had learned, and it really impressed him the good that could come just from even one person donating, and how many people could benefit just from that one person. It really left an impression and an impact on him. And we just spoke a little bit about that, and something that you, you need to understand is at the time of that conversation, I was undecided about organ donation, and that's really painful for me to tell you that, but I was, I'm just being honest. And it was something that I, I wasn't against, but I felt that I didn't know enough about it to feel like I could wholeheartedly support it. It was something that I never thought would affect me, that I would ever even have to think about or make a decision about. And I've learned through that experience that this is a topic that needs to be discussed with families. And um, it just needs to be discussed in general. And, and more understanding needs to be brought to the attention of this, of this topic. And um, I kind of tucked that conversation into the back of my head um, when I had that with my son, honestly never thinking that I was going to have to act upon it. And two and a half weeks later, he was walking to school on 13th East and in a crosswalk, and a car did not see him, and he was hit. And he sustained a very traumatic head injury. He lived for about eight days. And I then made the decision that it was best for him if we take him off of life support, he had no real chance of um, ever having any type of, of normal life. Um, and that was a difficult one. And I could never have imagined what was in store for me even when I made that decision. Um, I had a meeting that morning with the doctors and they gave me my options. And Dr. Poss, who was on rotation, military rotation at the time that my son was at Primary Children's, he, is now, he now works there. Um, very kind man, very kind doctor, and he simply just put it to me that, and you might want to think about organ donation if I did choose to, to disconnect life support. It was put to me in a way that I didn't feel threatened, I didn't feel like I was backed into a corner. It was very, um, you know, sensitively addressed, and, and I appreciated that because I still did not know how I felt about organ donation. And um, I thought about it all day, literally hours. And it was like I had a little monkey on my shoulder, it was probably Sebastian, telling me, 
donate. I just kept hearing donate, donate. And I went and found a nurse and asked if they could contact the people at IDS, and she did, and they had them come out to speak with me. It was an organ coordinator, it was Mike Ingram. And he sat there and was so patient and answered every single one of my questions that I had and was very kind. And um, as I went through the process, I'll be honest with you, I still didn't know how I felt about organ donation. I felt that I was doing it because it was what my son wanted. He made it very clear to me that he wanted to be an organ donor. He was very adamant about that. In fact, when he brought it up, he joked and he said, well, I'm planning on putting a yes on my driver's license. So if you're not okay with that, we're gonna hash this out now. We're gonna debate it out now. That's the kind of kid that he was even at 16. I said, no, I said, you've shown me that, you know, you're mature enough to make this decision for yourself. So that's what I really want you to understand is that it was, his wish and his choice. He was so adamant about that. No one ever plans on anything bad happening in this life. You know, we hope that nothing bad happens, but sometimes life does throw you a curveball. It does a 180, pulls the rug out from under your feet, and you are faced with a situation that you never, ever planned on. And that's the message I really want everyone to understand today is that when someone says yes to donation, they're making a conscious choice, and it is one that they are safeguarding, and it's, it's very sacred. I've, I've come to learn that because we can't speak for ourselves after we are gone, and I'm so grateful that Sebastian did that that day. It was only two and a half weeks after he had that conversation with me that he was hit by the car, and at the time in the hospital, I still couldn't have imagined the gift that he had given to me even by having that conversation. Um, when I did give consent to donate, I still honestly wasn't sure if that was the best choice for me. I knew it was the best choice for him. And later, um, came to learn about some of the people that he had donated to. And um, Carol was one of them. And, um, you know, I can only be told so much, obviously, HIPAA and privacy. and um, but I learned that it was a woman who received his liver. It was two men that um, received a kidney. And Sebastian was a DCD, and so he was only able to donate the kidneys and, and his liver, and he did donate some tissues. But I could never have imagined what was going to be given back to me even. And um, I always felt that I wanted to meet Carol. I didn't know when that was going to be. I always um, would ask how she was doing, didn't know much more other than her first name and that she lived north of Salt Lake. And um, it just seemed right one day and I made the request through Karen and that's one of the things that Karen, it's just amazing what she does, how she brings families together um, who do want to meet. And I made the request and Carol actually wanted to meet me before I even wanted to meet her. Um, but that request had to come from me and so it was about, I think, two years after, about two and a half years after Sebastian had passed away that I felt that that was the right time. And um, we met here in Salt Lake and her husband and her sister was with her. And um, it was an amazing experience. I will tell you that at first it was a little surreal to, to look at her and think she has my son's liver inside of her. But at the same time, it was the most wonderful feeling to, to know that part of him was able to live on and help give someone a second chance at life. That has been a great gift for me. And I know he's ecstatic that, that Carol gets this second chance because that was his choice. And that's something that's so important that you all understand. When I first talked to, to the original group that I did a few years ago, I never realized the guilt that was associated um, a lot of the time while you're waiting, and that was what broke my heart because I felt, you know, and I t I've talked to Carol about it, and I, and I hope I've helped her understand that this is a conscious choice that these donors make. My son would have passed away regardless. It was just his time to go. We're not all here for 90 years, you know. Um, it was his time to go, and he lived his life to the fullest, and, and he was a great kid. I'm grateful that I had him for 16 years. That's the way that I look at it. And I now look that he leaves on this legacy through his, his story, through his example. More people have learned about organ donation and understand it now because of his story. And I feel that that's a wonderful 
um, legacy to leave behind. But I also want you to know that it is a conscious choice. He made sure that I knew that about what he wanted when he was getting his driver's license, that he was adamant about being a donor. And so when Carol and I met, I didn't really know where that was going to go after that first meeting. I think we sat there for over four hours, about four and a half hours, and the only reason I think that we left was I had to go to work that day. And um, I think we probably would have sat there a lot longer. And I, and I instantly felt a connection with her and, and a bond with her. Um, I've never met the two gentlemen that have Sebastian's kidneys. I hope someday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. Yes, and, and, I, and I feel that I hope someday I can. I do want you to know, though, that our relationship is not the norm. Um, sometimes families meet, and maybe it's just once, and that's what they do. Other families do have relationships like Carol and I do, but that is not the norm. Um, also, a lot of times I've heard that um, recipients want to write to their, to their donor family, and I will tell you that anything is so appreciated. You could just, Carol could have just put a little scratch on the paper and it would have been so appreciated. I know that that's a hard thing. How do you say thank you for what you've received? And you know what, thank you is more than enough. Um, and I want you to know that because we are so grateful that you get a second chance at life when you get that organ. It does us a world of good too. It is a gift to us. My son gave me a gift that day. I don't know where I would be right now or what I would be doing had he not taken the time that day to have that conversation with me. Um, it's, it comes full circle. And you waiting, I, I know that's a hard thing, but be happy when you do get that, that gift of that organ that you need because your recipient would want you to be happy and live your life to the absolute fullest and enjoy your life and not feel bad, not feel guilty. Um, Carol and I do see each other on a regular basis. I feel like I'm part of her family. She's, you know, welcomed me in open-armed, and um, it's, it's been a great gift to me, too, um, having that extension, because Sebastian was my only child. And um, I'm just grateful that he did what he did that day. It made all the difference in the world. Um, anything else that you want me to? You want me to pass the mic to Carol? Okay. To you, or to Carol? Carol. Carol. Oh, actually, did anybody have any questions about? Uh, I will allow you Carol, oh. to pick. <laughs> to pick, sorry, to pick my brain. Yeah. You said that uh, you and Carol have a, a bond together. Yeah, we do. You have, you have a closeness. Is that because of the uh, liver? Or the, was it liver or kidney? She the has liver? his liver. Is it because of the liver, or is it because her? Uh, her, uh, character or her personality? I think it's a little bit of everything, you know, Did, I would never... Is it because your son, because your son is in her? Do I don't know, I that think, or? I, I don't necessarily feel that, I mean, I would look at her every once in a while and think, it's just surreal that Sebastian's liver is inside of her, but Carol is one of the kindest people I know, she really is, and um, I obviously would never have had the opportunity probably to meet Carol if the situation didn't happen. I look at it as, you know, a gift to me too. And like I said before, this is not the norm. It definitely is not. Most donors and recipients don't have this relationship, and I want you to understand that that's not expected of anyone. Why is that? Um, I think it's a little different for everyone. And there, I, I've known of some recipients that have no desire to meet their donor families, and I respect that. That is their choice. It might be too difficult for them to be able to have that emotional relationship because maybe they have a little bit more of, of, of guilt. I don't know what the right word to use um, would be, but I think, and I know Carol can speak for herself, but she's told me that by meeting me, it has helped her with those feelings that yeah, she's I would, had. I would think, you know, if I... If I got a heart from a donor, mm -hmm. you know, that's a gift from God. Mm -hmm. And I would want to meet that person, mm -hmm. you know, just to say thank you. you do. Because you some, it seems thank like you. sometimes when you receive a gift and you're not able to meet the uh, donor or don't, the donor don't choose to meet you, it just feels like, I don't know, it's like, wow, what did I do? I think, you know? I think one thing to keep in mind is that, that, that we're all, all so different 
are, everybody is so different in this world. And, and I use the analogy, and I don't mean to be trite by using this, but <clears throat> it's like if, if somebody meets, it, it's similar to a blind date. You either connect or you don't. Right. And, and so uh, I think the, the biggest hurdle for recipients would be to, to even feel OK about sending a thank you. And so that's kind of the first step is you send a thank you and then, and then wait and see if the donor family responds. And sometimes the donor family doesn't hear from a recipient and they'll decide to write to the recipient. And that can open up communication. And so I think, I think because of the so many emotions involved, the recipients are working on healing physically and emotionally. It's a, it's a life-changing um, event to go through to have a transplant. And so between them having, uh, having to get better, get adjusted to the medication, and then the donor family themselves grieving, and adjusting to life without their loved one. The interesting thing about Jerry um, and Carol was that Jerry, it, it was really a learning experience for me because I thought at any point she either never wanted to meet the recipient or six months later she did. And there was a lot of up and down and back and forth with it. And I think even after they signed a release, I think there was still a delay mm -hmm. in, in corresponding. Um, you, it's, it's just, it's almost like once you open that door, it's opened. And it may, it may be a positive thing, or you may just go, you know, I just don't connect with this person. I'm not sure why, I just don't. Well, Carol, what, what would, how would you have responded if she didn't correspond back to you? Um, well, I've been waiting for quite a while. I know when I released, when Karen asked me if I would like to meet my donor's family, I signed a release form that I would, and it was still a year before I met her, and I kept on thinking, well, maybe the donor family doesn't want to meet me, but I have always wanted to meet my donor family, and I kept on praying that someday I would, because I wrote her a little card, I think it was three weeks after which they told me might be a little bit too early, but I felt inside I needed to let this donor family know how grateful I was for the gift of life. They're, I didn't know and it was the sun either. I did not say it would be too oh. early. Okay. Just so you know. So, I okay. Think, I think. Anytime then, right? Yeah. Thing. And all I did was say, thank you for the gift of life. I was sorry for her lo their loss. I didn't know Jerry was. It was um, Jerry's only son, and and I just wrote, I think, you know, I'm sorry for your loss, but thank you for the gift of life because I felt so good afterwards. You know the roller coaster ride you're going on now. You you got your ups and downs. I was called in three times and had to come home before I got um, the right liver. I call it the right one, the perfect one for me. Um, and I'm just so thankful for that gift of life. You won't, you'll be amazed at what it does to you. And I, I would say write your donor family and just tell them thank you. And yes, you are sorry for their life, but that has helped me, that, um, the guilt. Because you feel guilty. You're praying for this heart mm -hmm. or whatever you're going through. My family, you know, we were praying for a liver every day knowing that someone was going to lose a loved one. And that's really hard. Mm -hmm. But this has helped knowing that it was Sebastian's choice. And that has helped me through this. And my family. It's helped my family too. So, And I've got a gift. I've got Jerry. i got another sister. Yeah. We go and do things. She's been on family trips with us. We, we go on trips together. And so she's just part of our family. July. We're going in July, <laughs> so it's it's a wonderful gift. Just take a gift and just do the best you can with it too. I, sorry, I just want to say really quick, um, Carol. Like I said, she could have just written anything, and I was grateful for that. Don't think that you have to write this big novel or, or anything. It just could just be as simple as thank you, like what Carol did, and it was so appreciated. It made, it made me feel so wonderful just to get that. It can be anything, and I promise you that your donor family will be very grateful for that, just the acknowledgement. The one point I want to make is 
to kind of address your question, I, I love having Jerry and Carol come and talk to this group because um, you're able to get the full spectrum, including the recipient point of view. I don't want someone to be watching this and think, I don't want that. You know, I don't, I'm, ne I'm not going to write a thank you because I don't want to open that door. I don't, my needs are different. I want, I'm thankful, but I don't want to open the door to meeting. So what I want to make a big point of making is that everybody's needs are different. You can absolutely write a thank you, acknowledge the gift you've received, and you can just let your social worker know at that point you don't want any more follow-up. Or you could accept a thank you. You could correspond through our office. You don't, we have people who correspond for years and they don't know each other's last name, but they send cards at Easter and Christmas. And so the, the, the point that's important is that a thank you is, as you've made known, is so important. It's other, it's often felt if, they don't receive a thank you or acknowledgement that nobody cares. They didn't even give it a second thought. And I hate to say that, but that is what the thinking is sometimes. Um, and it doesn't, a lot of people don't have the ability to write. They feel for whatever reason they can't emotionally say what they're thinking or they feel like they're a poor writer, a poor speller, English is their second language, uh, a variety of reasons, but you can just sign a card and that shows your family that, that you, the donor family, that you do care and that you are appreciative. I don't think any of the receive, uh, recipients can uh, thank the donor families enough for what they've given us. Mm -hmm. And you least on that. And um, the reason I would like to know the family's name is I ride motorcycles, you know, in memory patches they put on somebody's passed away. I've got a twin brother that passed away that I ride on my left side. And the one I want on the right side is in living memory of whoever my donor is. And that way somebody else can, what do you mean in living memory? It'd be a chance for me to communicate with them and get them to be a donor. I've been in the shrine for almost 40 years helping burn the crippled children and never once thought about being a donor. Never once until this happened. And uh, I can't tell enough people about how appreciative we are donor families. And thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Anything that they're wondering about? There's no topic or no subject off, you know, limits. I will answer anything, even, you know, anything personal. I really, yes. I had a run and the lung was no good. But I went through an awful lot of grieving for the family. Mm -hmm. It was the most unusual experience to me. And I was so grateful. But yeah, I felt like, how was I so lucky to deserve such a gift that I almost felt guilty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the doc, they uh, gave the right one to somebody else, and I was supposed to get the left one, but the left one wasn't good enough. And the doctor came in and says, I hope you're not disappointed. And going through, because it was about a 12-hour ordeal, I was all locked and loaded what I call it, mm -hmm. locked and loaded, ready to go. And I came in and it was like, I went through such a, a grieving process, almost to the point where did I feel like I was deserving enough mm -hmm. of such a gift. Mm -hmm. And the sorrow, you I mean, visually I could see the family grieving, but the family donated mm -hmm. for this person. Mm -hmm. And I felt the grief and the pain with them, mm -hmm. knowing that they was losing something. Mm -hmm. And I may be taking over a line. 
And the only thing that gave me peace with it was uh, that right. I would take care of it the best mm -hmm. way I could. Mm -hmm. oh, and that's the best way to look at it. And oh. it was a gift. Okay. But it didn't come through. <laughs> it <laughs> far. Um, next time, right, right, next next time. Um, my, and my left one, maybe next time, you know. But she, mm -hmm. I really grieved for a family. I think that's normal. She's talking about grieving um, when they do receive an organ. And that's one of the, the biggest things I want to let you know here today. That's why I'm so grateful that I can come and talk to this group to, to help you know and, and have that mindset that when somebody donates, it is such a conscious choice. They want to do something good for someone else. They safeguard that choice. They think about it ahead of time. And they would be thrilled to know that someone gets a second chance at life. And I know Carol can, can speak for that. I mean, we've talked about the guilt that she has felt and what she has gone through. And, um, and that was what broke my heart. I never thought about that because I looked at it. And I looked, and I understand that now, but I looked at it as, why would they feel guilty? And, and I've heard the same thing, what you were saying, like, well, why did I get it and not someone else? Why was it my turn? It's almost like survivor's guilt. And... I never thought of that once, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, to you, you should be happy you're getting this second chance at life, but at the same time, it's intertwined with all of this guilt, this grieving for this family, and I think that's normal. I, I think, I wish it didn't have to be that way, but yeah, I think it's normal because you know that someone passed away. We all care. We all have empathy, but I don't know if there's a way that it can be separated, and think about that donor it just was their time to go, whatever the situation was, and that's the way I look at it with my son. But that is what has gotten me through losing my son, is to know that Carol, because Carol's a runner, and she's done marathons since receiving that liver transplant, half marathons, and, um, and my son was a runner. And so to know that he's still kind of running and, and, and enjoying life through her. Um, and I think maybe she can tell you a little bit more about how she got through that process of, of grieving, but I know that that donor would want you to be happy and just go out there and live your life to the fullest and be ecstatic. I don't think you really ever get over it because to this day I still think, why do I have Sebastian's liver and you know why is he gone? But uh, like Jerry, I have to look at it like Sebastian's mission was completed here on earth and mine's not, and he gave me the second chance Amen. to to do what I'm supposed to do, which may be come here and talk with Jerry. And because anytime they ask us to go do something, I get off work, I do anything I can so I can go with Jerry and go to her presentations that she does and everything to show people that donation does work. Because some people don't think, oh, you know, it doesn't work, but it does work. I was very ill. Um, I was a 100 pound skeleton <coughs> with a 20 pound liver. And I worked and went to the gym every day just to keep strong. And after I received the liver, I was at the hospital six days. And that, I think, is still the record down there. <laughs> but I just kept strong. And that was the hardest part is I know how sick you guys get. It, you have to keep strong and keep going. And your attitude, um, I, I did cry. But I would only give myself so long, you know, like five minutes a day, I will have a little pity party for myself and then carry on. And I have two boys that um, I, wanted to, I needed to be there for, too. And I would never cry in front of them, which sometimes maybe I should have, so they knew how bad mom really was. Maybe they would have done the dishes a little more. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um, just the attitude, is, too, is what helps you through this. And like I said, I, you don't ever get over that, that why me, but it is such a gift. So I do do what I can to let people know. I talk about um, donor, donation all the time. Mm -hmm. I work for a dentist, and he, um, I, you know, when you work for a dentist, you got the patient laying there, mouth open, they can't say a word. They hear about it every day. So. <laughs> Were you a donor before you knew you needed? Yes, to have I was a, a donor too. Okay. Yes. I think that makes a difference. That too. makes a difference too. And that, and I had uh, nieces that were 16 and went, you know, through the driver's ed thing. They made all their friends be donors. They let them know it works, you know. 
And so through this, I think there has been more donors through my family, because there was a lot of them that weren't donors, and now there's, yes, there, yes it does work. Because people don't really see, you know, firsthand what it looks like. So, and from the pictures I was to now, I'm fat and sassy, loving it, <laughs> and keeping going. So. That's a good point that Carol brings up. Um, through Sebastian's situation in the hospital, a lot of um, people that I, I was acquainted with didn't know either how they felt about organ donation. And through the experience of, of seeing me um, go through what I went through, Sebastian's example, every single one of those people now is a donor, have changed. If they had no, they've now changed. Or if they were undecided, have definitely decided to support it. And that's something else I want you to understand is I was never against donation. I simply had heard a lot of those miscommunic, you know, mis, um, those untruths out there, the misconceptions. And I didn't know what to believe or, or, or I didn't know how it really worked. And I definitely got a crash course, um, I'm grateful that I can now use that experience to help educate and bring awareness to something that is so needed and to, to put a positive side to it because there is a lot of negative um, and things that people believe that are just simply not true. And, um, and it all started with Sebastian you know, coming home and just striking up that conversation. And um, I definitely, obviously, wholeheartedly support it. I will do anything. I will talk about it. Um, to anyone that will listen, because there are so many people that don't have a full understanding of how it works. I think a lot of people just think there's plenty of donors that you don't even yeah. think about donating. Like I said myself, I never even thought about it. Mm -hmm. And since I've been home two weeks, everybody I talk to, yeah. look at my scar, and let me tell you what you can do, or you don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a, one of the first places I went to the DPS be sure, don't let my family know I wanted to be a donor. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, I think I didn't realize the great need that there was, and that's why I was kind of just, I don't know, kind of apathetic about it. Like I thought, oh, well, I really can't make a difference. Oh my gosh, I've learned <laughs> so differently the difference that one can make. That has really been um, just amazing to me. And that's what Sebastian came home and talked about. The good, I mean, one donor can help save nine lives through donation of organs. If you donate tissues, it's 50 or more. Give your corneas to people have eyesight. And that was really amazing. It really left an impact with him. And I just thought, wow. You know, I think we've all felt at one time or another, I'm just one person, I don't really make a difference. And this is definitely a way that someone can make a difference. It's been amazing. Did you? Was your whole family in agreement uh, with you and your son um, about I have, being a donor? It was my whole family in agreement. Um, I have a very unique situation. I don't have family. I, um, I know, I'm an only child. I have Carol. I do have family. Um, I definitely am not the norm. I am not married. I was by myself. Um, no siblings. Sebastian was my only child. We couldn't find his dad at the time. Um, so it was so really basically uh, yours and his his decision first, right? And then you uh, right. And I knew that um, I actually did know how Sebastian felt about life support because he was notorious for um, riding his longboard without his helmet, and we actually had talked about that. And I said, "What am I going to do if you're ever in that situation?" And this is, I don't know, crass or blunt, but he looked at me and he said, like. He turned around and had this look on his face like, I can't even believe that you're asking me this. He's like, Mom, it was just pull the plug. <laughs> and I said, okay. I, you know, he really believed that there was life after this one. And he lived more life, I kid you not, in 16 years than a lot of people do in 80 or 90 years. That kid had a life. And I am grateful for that. And he lived it to the fullest. And that's why he came home and spoke to me about organ donation. He wanted to make sure that he could help someone if he ever had the opportunity to do so. And that's what you need to take from here today is knowing that that donor who makes that decision and puts that yes on their driver's license wants something good to come out of, maybe an untimely death or an unfortunate situation. 
and someone else can have that second chance and have a great life. So you have to look at it that way. And I hope that that it's easier said than done, I know, but hopefully it can ease some of that guilt and pain that, that those recipients feel. Looks like uh, our other better half is here. Um, any other questions before Angela starts speaking? Uh, I just wanted to follow up on uh, a question about if a recipient decides they do want to write to their donor family, the process in general with most of the transplant centers is that you can talk to your social worker about it and um, they will give you, we, I have an article that I've written about writing, you can use that. You can also call me, my name and email is on the article. Basically, uh, you could write a note, sign a card. We ask that you don't put identifying information on it, so you can put your first name, but please don't put your last name or address or email. It's not that at some point you can't give the donor family that information, but the first couple exchange of uh, correspondence, we prefer that you don't do that. Uh, you can call me and ask me who you'll be writing to. So if you've received an organ and are kind of flummoxed about how to write because you can't even visualize who you're writing to, I can tell you that you will be, as an example, be writing to parents or a sibling or you'll be writing to a child. Um, and that, and I will tell you that the donor was male or female. That is about the only information I can give you, but at least it helps you to formulate in your mind who it is that you're writing to. So in general, the first go-to point would be your social worker, the transplant social worker, and then they can give you information on how to contact me. And uh, without further ado, I'll introduce Angela Ciada. She is one of our fabulous coordinators. She does, um, works through the whole process, beginning with uh, taking the call on a possible donor, going through consent, and she can talk more about what she does. She, her background is that she's an RN, and you've been here how long? Um, two and a half years. Two and a half years with IDS. So she'll answer all the technical questions that you have about this. As Karen explained, my name is Angela Sayada. Um, I am an organ coordinator, and I work with Intermountain Donor Services, um, work from the beginning to the end of, of a case. And so I'll kind of, my slideshow go through what it is I actually do, okay? Um, before I started working for Intermountain Donor Services, I was a ICU nurse. I worked in the ICU. I actually um, took care of liver recipients sometimes, sometimes pancreas and kidney recipients as well. So I started, that's kind of where my background was, was in the ICU, and then I decided to go and start this. So. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. This is just a little bit about Intermountain Donor Services, um, just who we are as Intermountain Donor Services, that we're a nonprofit. We've been in business since 1983. We cover all of Utah, part of Idaho, um, Wyoming and then just Elko, Nevada is our service area, okay? There's about three million people in our service area. There's probably more than that now, I would bet. Um, and that's, you know, between Utah and parts of Idaho and Wyoming. 83 hospitals and as you know, those are growing as well. Um, approximately 40 um, full-time employees, but we have a lot of part-time, per diem, um, volunteers, lots of people that help us do what we do. That you mentioned? Not necessarily. I, actually, I'll go through some of that information and kind of tell you how, or how that process works. Mm -hmm. But that's, yeah, not necessarily. Um, have you guys all seen this logo? Seen our cab around? This is our cab. This kind of helps us promote organ donation. This is our, um, what this represents is the Utah Donor Registry. Have any of you heard of the Utah Donor Registry? So when you go and get your driver's license, um, they ask you, do you want to be an organ donor? And that's a yes, no question. Um, if you put yes on your driver's license, that means that that's your consent for organ donation. What that also means is that at the time of your death, 
If you've put yes on your driver's license, your family doesn't have to say yes. That's your yes, okay? Um, so we give family, obviously, information and, and talk to them about the process, but they don't actually have to give consent at that time, okay? You have to wait for renewal time to put yes on your driver's license, or can you? Go up at any time. You can go up at any time. We actually have an, on our website, Intermountain Donor Services, we have a link to, it's called YesUtah, or I think it's YesUtah.org, and you can go there and sign up as a, as a donor even before you have to wait for your renewal. So this is, OPO stands for Organ Procurement Organization, and that's what Intermountain Donor Services are. Each of us cover certain regions of the country. So no matter where you go in the country, there is an, uh, there's an OPO, people that do what we do. But we exchange organs depending on the need and how the lists come about. So I'll start talking about that stuff as well. So f in August 1998, the state decided to make it a uh, um, law that the hospitals now have to report every death to Intermountain Donor Services so that we can evaluate to see if somebody can or cannot be an organ donor and or a tissue donor as well. So they must report all deaths to us. Sorry. Must ensure that the family has every opportunity to donate organs. We never would want a fam or someone to pass away and never have that opportunity have been asked if they want their loved one to be an organ donor. That's not fair to the family because it means so much to those families that donate and it means so much to you guys as recipients. And they're required to, we're, uh, we're required to work with the hospitals and educate them. We do, I do very similar stuff just like this with the hospitals, with nurses. I also do um, education with EMS, all of that, those kinds of education groups that we work with. Donor myths. There is a lot of donor myths out there. Do you guys have donor myths? Can you guys tell me a little bit about what, you, what your donor myths are? See if I'll address those. Do you have one? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've heard that uh, sometimes a person uh, stays in and gets a heart, but uh, maybe uh, the person has been on drugs that, uh, and they do have a donor card, but they've been on drugs and stuff. Does that, uh, uh, is the heart uh, affected by all of that? It can be, absolutely. Yes, it can be. And that is all of the information that we, and I'll kind of go into that a little bit more, but that's all the information we gather and we present all of that information to your physician. Your physician makes that decision on whether it's really going to be a good heart for you or not, or an organ. Prior to you getting it. Yes. And if, and we can tell if they've done drugs and there's damage to the organ and it's not going to get better, then most likely that, that organ's not going to be transplanted but sometimes they can recover. So that's a possibility. First donor myth that <clears throat> we hear the most is that the family has to pay for the cost of organ recovery. Do you guys think that's true? Okay, that's right, it's not true, it's false. Um, we as an organ recovery service pay for all those costs to evaluate organs, to you know, start generating information so that we can get those organs to the right places. We occur all those costs, all the hospital costs. If you're an organ donor, you can't have an open casket. That's true, you can. Um, why do you think people have, um, even if not as an organ donor, isn't it, even as a tissue donor, can you still have an open casket as a tissue donor? Tissue. Yeah. They put in um, prosthetics back in, fill that in. Um, if you're clothed, obviously, um, you know, that you, you couldn't tell that somebody was an organ donor. Yeah. I'm too old to be a donor. Do you know what the age is? There really is certain ages for it. It varies on different organs. But um, really, we've transplanted up to 79 years old for livers. Um, livers, obviously, are a lot more resilient. Um, for tissue and eyes, eyes, really, it's almost any age for cornea. 
having the donor designation on your driver's license may affect your care. No. Okay. A lot of people believe that, which is really sad. And the very first goal of any medical team going to medical school, me going to nursing school, number one is always to save lives. We always try to save lives first. If we cannot, and all efforts have been exhausted, then this could be an option. But it will not affect the care that you get. My religion is against donation. Do you guys know of any religions against donations? Yeah. Why? Isn't uh, Jehovah's Witness? Witness? They are not. That is, it's called an individual choice, yeah. and each individual gets to make that individual choice. We've had Jehovah Witnesses. I've well, particularly. Well, if it was left up to my mother, I would not have gotten it. Because <laughs> she's a Jehovah Witness. That's obviously her particular choice. <laughs> so, but it is an individual choice. On it's not the religion abroad is what we're trying to say there. It's the individual's choice. Muslims. No, Muslims is also um, an individual choice. Really? Muslim has more to do with the burial. It has to do with when they're buried. Oh, okay. And, and we can sometimes accommodate that. <coughs> and the best thing is to always ask, if you wonder about your religion, you can ask your clergy. There's a black market in the US for organs. <laughs> <coughs> no, there's not. No, no it's very um, illegal, number one. The National Organ Transplant Act makes it illegal, and there is no selling of organs in the United States. Now, in other countries, that does happen, unfortunately. The rich and famous get organs first. That's not true as well. It does have to do, and we'll talk more, you guys, but... I think you guys know a lot more about that even than I do on how you're listed. How do you get listed? What's the priority of your listing? All of that stuff. Well, um, I, I mean, I've experienced somebody that's been uh, turned down for another person to have it before they do because of how wealthy they are or the political arena. That's not true. I've seen that happen. That's actually not true. Um, it doesn't have to do with Political, it doesn't have to do with um, more, it just has to do with, everything has to do with your tissue typing, your blood typing, where you are in location to the donor, and then what your physician feels like is right for you. Because all of you are different, right? You're all made up of different things. The, your physician has to decide if that organ is gonna be right for you long term. Because why transplant you, and you have to get another transplant in two to three years? That doesn't do you any favors, and it sure doesn't do the person that just donated their organ any favors. Mm -hmm. I waited three weeks from the time I came here until I got my heart. So wow, uh, that's amazing. Yes, I mean, and it's because they said I didn't smoke or drink. I would never have, 65 years old, never done any of this. And, uh, the cards aligned for you. Because <laughs> that, that, that mean, is everything. Everything rare. Is, uh, now, certain parts of the country, it's easier to get an organ than it is other parts of the country because of population. That is a fact. So if you're in Florida, if you're in New York, you're gonna wait on the transplant list much, much longer than you are here in Utah. Our population is much is different. Our population of donors is different in Utah. So that's the other part of that too. Signing a donor card is all you need to do. That's also false. What we want you to do is talk to your family um, families need to know what your decision is. Families need to know what your feelings are about that. And what um, is the age limit for a child to make his, own, his or her own decision? Well, the age for a child to make their own decision is 18, adult age. Now, if they're under 18 and even though they've signed a yes on their driver's license, their parent still has to give consent because, of course, they're under age. But that's when we encourage, please talk to your family. Please let your family know what your feelings about this are. So when, Jer when Jerry's son had, he's 16, he was 16, yes. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. He made his choice, he wanted to do it. He did. Now let's say you'd say, no, I, I don't feel comfortable with that. And he still wants to pursue it. She could um, have said no. No, but I'm I sorry. will tell you, sorry, no, I will tell you when I talked about how important that conversation was that he had with me that day. Yeah. I'm 99.9% .9 sure had he not had that conversation with me, 
I would not have donated anything. And that's the truth. And that's, again, painful to say, yeah, but I'm being right. honest with you, to help you understand that this is a key element to helping people know. Because right. do, do we always agree as families? No. no. Sometimes we have to agree to disagree, right. but we can be respectful of someone else's opinion and choice. And that's what I did that day for okay. Sebastian. I knew how important it was for him. I still didn't know that day when I gave consent. I did it because I knew it was exactly what he wanted and to honor his wishes. And then I figured it out afterwards and got my crash course. But that conversation made all the difference in the world. Yeah. Communication, then. Huh? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Very key. Thank you. Yeah. So this is the timeline of successful organs transplanted. Um, first organ was in 56 years ago was a kidney. We've come a long way since then. Yes. How many people are on the waiting list? This is as of January 7th, 2011. Lord have mercy. Mm. Mm. Oh, this is a national waiting list. Yep, this is national. Still this is in Utah. <laughs> As of that much better. <laughs> that's still a lot. Yeah, chance. You got a lot. chance to get one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's still a lot, though. Good Lord. Uh, actually, I'm going to show you that. So this is a little bit of that breakdown of who's waiting for kidneys, liver, and this is at that moment in time. So this is was January seventh. Today, of course, that's changed. Up but at down. that moment in time. Up or down? I, I don't know, to be honest with you. <laughs> I would think it'd be down. Mm, I, I don't mean, know. I mean, there'd be probably more now than yeah. need some more. Pro probably yeah, more people. Saying. Yes. Usually the need grows. So this is, uh, this is kind of an old slide, but it shows you our dilemma of how many people are on the waiting list wow. and how many donors there are. Wow. And it's kind of steady with how many donors there are. But of course, recipients continue to rise and need, which is understandable. So how we match organs. So this is gonna kind of start talking to you about what it is that I do and how we figure this out and how you guys hopefully can get transplanted or get your, have gotten your transplants. Um, obviously, blood blood type, height and weight, certain organs, it, mean, it, it matters what your height and weight is compared to the donor. Um, medical urgency, sickest are on the top. So it is quite amazing that you got an organ in three weeks and, and not being, I don't know how sick you were at the time sick. of your transplant. But if you were very sick, then you get moved up. 260 to 139. So it just depends on, were you on an LVAD or a BIVAD? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, Shot straight through all that. Wow, you got lucky because most people wait on, and, yes, and the cards yes. did align. <laughs> But, some, you know, I mean, so it just depends on how sick you are. And uh, as you know, the sicker you are, the more points you earn, that kind of stuff to move you up on the list. I honestly, I don't, because I don't do that side, I don't know a lot of that information. I know basically what I just told you. So I'm sure you all know way more than I do about that. Is it there, has there ever been uh, a transplant for a uh, child, say, from the 18? Uh, age uh, back. Has there ever been any kind of transplant? I, I guess I don't know what you mean by that. Younger than 18. Uh, yeah. Has any uh, young child from the age of 18 back to say 12 ever had any uh, thing that caused them to have a transplant? Have they ever done it? Oh yeah, or every there's de definitely older. pediatrics are listed and actually pediatrics have. I'll show you what a wait list kind of looks like. Pediatrics do have a little bit higher priority um, on the list it's for certain organs, depending on how what those organs are, and depending on this is all governed, and um, everybody's listed a certain way. So, Angela, you guys have even done not very small, just very small babies. Yes, we do babies even. even. Just week old babies, month old babies. Yes, no. that either need transplants or have been a donor. So this is a wait list. Um, this is for a kidney. It's just a test, of course. But you can see how the highest score, like if you need a kidney, you have high um, antigens, then the higher the antigens, the harder it is for you to get that kidney. So you can be at the top of the list sometimes. 
Um, and then it goes to pediatrics. Every list is different. So every list and the priority of that, whether it's a heart, whether it's lungs, whether it's liver, they're all different in their categories, but it, it depends on, so it all depends on the organ. So there are three types of donors. Organ donors, and this is here in Utah, and this is in our area, we do about 80 to 95 a year. The different organ donors are donation after brain death, which is what you typically um, hear about and hear mostly in the media, and then there's um, what's called DCD, donation after cardiac death, and actually they're even starting to change the term to circulatory death. Tissue donors, we do about 400 a year, tissue. That's bone, ligaments, heart valves, um, some skin. And then living donors, living related, um, Good Samaritan, those kinds of donors. So a typical organ donation process. So from what, what I do, what my job is, is the hospital calls me and lets me know that they have an imminent death, possibly, um, and gives me information about that person. Um, then we take that information and say, okay, yes or no, we think this person could or could not be an organ donor, depending on their past medical history, depending on their social history, depending on what their injuries were, why they're dying, um, what they're dying from, all of those things. Is there potential organs there that could be transplanted? Um, and so we evaluate that, go on site even to the hospitals and evaluate further, dig into more of their medical information. Um, do that evaluation that I just talked about. Approach and consent. Um, so we work in collab collaborative with the hospitals um, to speak with the families when their loved one is dying and give them this option of donation. Um, if somebody's on the donor registry, it's a matter of telling that their family, that their loved one wanted to be a donor, you know, and that we'll go through the donor process. Um, if they're not on the registry, it's a matter of finding out if the family wants to donate or not. Donor maintenance. So they will remain in the ICU on a ventilator. This is on somebody that's brain dead and even somebody, sorry, for DCD, donation after cardiac death. And it takes us about 18, uh, 18, we say 12 to 48 hours, sometimes less. We try to make that, but that's a long time. The reason why it takes that much time is because we have to gather not only all their medical and social information, all their information about their hospital stay, the injuries they've had, all of that kind of stuff, look at all the individual organ function. So we're not, we're not managing one person, we're managing eight people eight potential lives with that one donor, if they're a brain dead donor. So it takes us that time. And when I said earlier how hearts can recover, sometimes with the dying process, especially of herniation of the brain, when somebody has brain death, that can do what's called stunning the heart. And the heart goes through a stunning process and it doesn't pump as well because you have a big catecholamine release. You have all these hormone things going on in your body that your heart has a hard time with. If we give that time and give certain drugs to help that, we have found that those hearts actually recover and do better. And 24, 36 hours later, they can be transplanted and they're gonna work great for you. So it just takes that time. Then we take all that information, we put it into the national database, UNOS, um, and generate those lists. And it, we just push a button and it generates the list according to how you're listed and all that, those rules. So we have nothing to do with how you, how you show up on the list. So by my running a list, but I can't manipulate that so that you show up differently on the list. You show up according to how you're supposed to be on the list because it's all computer generated. And then organs and tissues are recovered and that's where also I will go to the, uh, the operating room with the physicians um, and make sure that each organ gets packaged correctly and in the right and it goes to the right places. Okay. Types of brain injuries that are caused by brain death, these are the ones that we see the most. 
head traumas, although that's a little bit lower these days. It's actually strokes um, or intracranial bleeds that seem to be the more, something that we see more of. And then anoxic injuries that has to do with drug overdoses and things like that. Donation after cardiac death. This is where there's neurological injury to the brain but does not meet brain death criteria. For somebody to meet brain death criteria is very hard. Um, not only do they have to have, the cortex of their brain has to be non-functioning, but it also means the brain stem is non-functioning as well. And sometimes people can have so much injury here, but still have their brain stem left. Your brain stem controls how you breathe, if you take a breath, how your heart beats, all those kinds of things, okay? Um, if their brain stem is still affected, they do not meet brain death criteria and they cannot be a brain death donor. Even though their family knows it's a devastating injury, non-recoverable, they'll never be the same, they'll never walk, they'll never talk, all of those things, and the family wants to withdraw, we can give them this, this option. Family and MD to have to decide to withdraw support. IDS is called and we offer this type of donation. We do have to obtain consent. So even though you have a yes on your driver's license, if you're DCD, so in Jerry's case, if her, if her son was 18, we still would have had to get consent from her because this person is not dead. They're not legally dead, okay? So we still have to get consent. But we do let the families know that they had a yes on their driver's license and that obviously donation was important to them. We do the same workup. It takes a little bit less time, um, usually 12 to 24 hours. We've even done them as quickly as two to four hours. Um, usually that's with pediatrics. We don't like to do that because we don't have as much time to be able to um, get all the information into UNOS, find the right recipients. Some people, some of you guys live out of state. Can you get here in two hours? Sometimes you can't. You know, sometimes you can't get here in time and then there's too much cold time on that organ and it wouldn't be a good organ for you, so. Support is withdrawn in the ICU and the family can be present. Some OPOs or some places in the country do it differently. They withdraw in the operating room. We do not do that. We have just chose that we feel families are more comfortable in the ICU. They can be with their loved one as they're, as they're dying. They must reach cardiac death within 60 minutes. We've actually moved that up to 90 minutes even with younger um, recipients or younger donors, but it's not, I mean, it, it all depends on the donor's history, it depends on their age, depends on their organ function. But as that dying process happens, because you're pulling the tube in the ICU, their organs are getting no oxygen, as that dying process happens, that's hurting those organs. It's a rapid transport when the heart stops, or actually when their circulatory stop, um, then we move to the operating room. And it's a rapid recovery of liver and kidneys. Liver and kidneys are the only things that we currently, in the state um, of Utah, transplant, is liver and kidneys from DCD. Other places in the country have done lungs, and some have done hearts as well. More in pediatrics, but it's something that um, we're not quite there and ready to do yet. We just don't find out that they just don't, their survival in the end is not as well. So recipients usually don't, those organs don't do as well, the recipients don't do as well. These are the organs that are able to be transplanted, as you guys probably know. This is the preservation time. So this is the time that the Cold solution goes into the organ and warm blood goes back into the organ. That's the, how much time it has. So it all depends on, this is why it's important to be where it's closest to where the donor is. But that doesn't mean that um, sometimes the sickest person in the region within a certain amount of miles, sometimes you will show up on the heart list first because you're a status 1A and you're sick and the donor's in California and we will go get that organ. 
um, but it's because you're so sick you need it. And you can have a little bit of cold time on that, that organ, a little bit. Um, you know, obviously we take private jets and we fly. It's quick, you know, usually an hour or two flight. Um, but we can go to other parts of the country. Now, as far as going to New York for heart, we're not going to do that. That's too far. It's not quick enough. Um, but kidneys are able to be um, sent, and kidneys are usually sent commercially, and they're able to be sent on a private or on a commercial flight and sent to New York, Florida, places like that. Kidneys are also able to be pumped. Um, and kidneys can be put on a pump and put on a pump for a while and sometimes can, you know, it'd be 48 hours even before a kidney can be transplanted sometimes. This is a donor, Madison. So, and, and would, like her heart and her liver, um, pancreas, <coughs> nah, maybe not pancreas, um, would go into a child her size. Now kidneys are usually transplanted Ch child kidneys are usually transplanted into adults, and adult kidneys are transplanted into pediatrics. Really? It has to do with the way they grow and how they, they function. So, this is Lauren. This is Jerry <laughs> and Sebastian. <laughs> This is Rocio. She um, helps our Hispanic community. Um, sometimes people have that myth that the Hispanic community um, is, does not donate. They actually do, but they do have a lot of myths as well because guess where's one of the places in the, in the world that there is a black market for organs? It's in Mexico. Yeah. Um, and so they have, sometimes Hispanics have a hard time believing in our system and that we have rules about that. Rocio helps us with that. Not only can she speak their language, not only is she from there, but they understand her and trust her. She does a ton of outreach too, where she helps her community, not only educating, but helps the donor families if they need, they're sending their loved one back to Mexico if they need help in some way. She is just a great support for that community. So IDS, these are the things Karen talked to you about what we, we give the family bereavement information. We are the liaisons between you and the donor families. If you write letters, those letters come through us first. Um, and then we do the ceremonies and all that kind of stuff. When I sit down and speak with families, I tell them a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times families will ask me, will I get to know what organs were transplanted? Will I get to know the recipient? And I explained to them that maybe in time that both parties have to agree. Um, but if they want to write a letter, it would come through us. If you guys want to write a letter, it will come through you. I also explained to them that sometimes I I'd never want them to be hurt by if they don't get a letter from you. Um, and I don't want them to be surprised by that. And so I will explain to them how much tremendous guilt you all have and I'm, I'm sure you do, that you are alive and their loved one is not. And, you know, and that, that's hard. It's hard for you to form those words. How do you say thank you? Yeah. And so, and I explained that to them. But it's so meaningful for them when you guys do send letters. It really is meaningful. And they really appreciate it. So, but I explain all that stuff. So. Okay. This is our 5K dash for donation. Um, we do this, this is going to be August 13th this year, it's the second Saturday in August. <laughs> this is for promoting organ donation. There is also on Library Square, there is a donor, what's called the Donor Monument Wall. It's a glass wall um, and all the donors' names of families that want their loved one to be on that wall, their names are etched in the glass. And that's anybody that's an organ, tissue, blood, any, you have to donate so much blood, um, but any type of donor. So the most important thing, obviously, is discuss it with your families. Even, even with you guys. Do you guys think that you can be organ donors? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, you can. If, if that's something that you choose. 
um, you could still be an organ. There's certain parts um, that could possibly be donated. Um, and we've actually had that happen, where somebody gets a transplant, the transplant doesn't work out so well, but they are able to become a donor even. And so they're able to pay it forward and donate.